My dearest brethren, Christ is risen, alleluia. I must admit, after having given up coffee for the season of Lent, the first sip after having the great, uh, offered the great Easter vigil last night was simply divine. <laughs> A very happy Easter to every single one of you. So we've been following Christ through Lent. We've been following him with fasting, with prayer, and with almsgiving. We have tried to keep close to him during Holy Week, through his betrayal, the scourging, the mocking, and the agonizing death. And now we joyfully and gratefully share with him in the victory of the resurrection. Indeed, without the resurrection, his life and his sufferings would have been meaningless, completely meaningless. His death reveals the tragedy of human life when it is in conflict with God. But it also reveals God's compassion, his compassion toward us, despite our sin. In Christ's resurrection, it shows that the love and forgiveness that he displayed in his death, it leads to glory. It leads to new life. In him, Death and resurrection cannot be separated. But though we have followed Jesus through the last week of his life, it's not quite the same for us as it was for the apostles. As we went through Holy Week over the past few days, we knew how the story would end. The apostles didn't. All along, we knew that on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. They didn't have that comfort. For them, his death was the end. They would never see him again. They had let him down at the very moment when he needed them. And now they wouldn't be able to seek his forgiveness, to ask for mercy in their minds. And if we think about it, the greatest mysteries of this life, they happen in secret. A seed begins to grow in the earth, in the, in the secretness of the ground. A conception of a child, it happens in the secret of the mother's womb. And the ultimate mystery of God being made flesh, it happened really without anybody knowing that he came to earth in his mother's womb. The ultimate mystery, likewise, of the resurrection, it happened in the dark of the tomb without anyone there to witness the event. Instead of the apostles, instead the, the apostles find an empty, hewn out tomb. And it wasn't celebrated with great pomp and joy. They wept, they were scared. Mary Magdalene even mistook him for the gardener. And they all hid in the upper room. It was a time that was marked with real fear. And the gospels do say that he warned the apostles that he would suffer and he would die and he would rise again. But the gospels also say that they, they simply didn't understand what he meant. They didn't get it. Many, though not all, of the Jews at the time believed in the resurrection of the dead. But they were thinking of a general resurrection in the future, when God would finally establish his kingdom on earth and all the righteous would be gathered together in eternal bliss. They never imagined that one person would be resurrected ahead of the rest. So it is not surprising that the first reaction of the disciples to report of the resurrection wasn't joy, it wasn't relief, it wasn't gladness or rejoicing. The women who came to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, they were told by the young man dressed in white that he had been raised, he's not here. And they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, says St. Mark. St. Luke later says that when the women later reported to the apostles what they had seen and heard, these words, they seemed like an idle tale. They simply didn't believe it. 
In all the resurrection appearances in the Gospels, there is this mixture of belief and unbelief, of slow recognition, of being sure but still not sure all at the same time. Yes. He was the same, and yet he was different. He was transformed. Can you blame them for hesitating? It was almost too good to be true. Two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until they broke yes. the bread. Okay, and he vanished. Like, I have it, but I don't have it Later, when they were having I their breakfast of fish by the lakeside, St. John says, none of the mm -hmm. disciples dared to ask him, who are you? because they knew it was a risen Lord. Yeah. If our experience of the risen Christ is unlike that of the apostles, it is and much nearer to that of St. Paul. He knew how the story had ended. Uh -huh. He had heard like us that Jesus had been crucified, but he resisted this. And boy, did he resist fiercely, passionately, so much so that he persuaded the or he pursued the followers of Jesus even to death. Then suddenly, the light broke in on him too. It's like that Bruce Springsteen song, "Blinded by the Light." He was blinded, literally and metaphorically, dazzled by the light that shone on his eyes. And in his mind, he heard, who are you? He asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you were persecuting. The crucified and risen and glorified Jesus identified himself with those whom Paul was persecuting. And therefore, with all of us, instantly, he recognized Jesus as Lord, and his life would never be the same. Indeed, in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, everything has changed, my brethren. And I think our celebration of the resurrection is missing something here. We tend to associate fear and bewilderment with the cross, and joy and new life with the resurrection. And in a sense, that's true. But the Gospels tell us that those whom the resurrection was announced experienced be bewilderment, terror, and incomprehension. And perhaps maybe we domesticate the resurrection. We talk about it in a safe and comfortable way, like the, gl like the glory of a beautiful sunrise. But this doesn't do it justice. It doesn't do justice to the overwhelming and blinding eruption of the glory of God that was made present to us in the face of the risen Christ. The resurrection is continually happening to us. The light, the vision, it's all pouring onto us, into us. And our eyes may be dazzled by the light, Perhaps we're blinded by seeing it. We try to open our blinded eyes to see him in himself and in one another. And at the same time, the resurrection is not yet for us. It's still awaiting us. We are still in the darkness in some ways, but we're walking towards that light in awe and trembling and hoping for courage. And so now, my dear brothers and sisters, we wait. We wait with a slight bit of fear and trembling, just as the disciples did in the upper room. And we look forward to the next 50 days in which we wait for the advocate, the Holy Spirit to come down with fire and to give us courage, to give us zeal, to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We may be ready, may we be ready to respond with great courage to the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us so that we may set the world ablaze. The Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia.